Hi there, I'm Melanie. Welcome back to my channel. If you're a returning subscriber, thanks so much for clicking. I truly appreciate your support. If this is your first time, welcome. Do me a favor, take a second, hit subscribe, and please don't forget to like and share. What I love about YouTube is that we can travel the world from coast to coast, continent to continent, all from the comfort of our home. Now, many of us go to YouTube to look at different funny activities, things that make a laugh, entertain us. Others go to learn how to do things. Some go to be informed. But I never thought I would tell you that I go to YouTube to be educated. Yes, educated. Now, I like to think of myself as an educated woman. But what I've discovered as traveling the globe and learning about different countries and cultures is that I haven't been educated very well. No, in fact, in North America, we've been told one side of the story. So as I travel throughout Africa with Wadamaya, I am discovering the lack of education and understanding I have about the history of Africa. I'd like to share with you what I discovered on my trip to Zimbabwe with Wadamaya. Zimbabwe got a lot to show the world and I know that these videos that I've been uploading will not show you more of Zimbabwe but I'm trying my possible best to do a bit just to let you know that Zimbabwe is not what you think. Zimbabwe indeed is not what I expected. What I appreciate about Watamaya is whenever he takes us to a new country he shows us the beautiful scenery. He tells us about what we're seeing with him but he lets the locals share their story. He feels it's important for them to tell us what they're seeing, what they feel about their country, as well as about the history. When I went to Harare, I was told that the second biggest city in this country is Bulawayo. And I was like, how do I get to Bulawayo? Because I want to go to every corner of this beautiful country so that I'll be able to educate myself and educate my audience. We hired a Prado all the way from Harare to Bulawayo, the city of kings and queens. So when Watamaya takes us to Zimbabwe, he talks to some locals to find out a little bit more about the, how they feel about their country. Of course, they love it. Why not? It's beautiful. Well, what, what are you going to say about yeah, why not? I, I want you to tell me something about Zimbabwe. What are you going to say? How about Zimbabwe? <laughs> he notices something. Look, shares with us that things represent Durban in South Africa. After traveling to 25 countries, this place gives me a vibe of South Africa. I feel like I'm in mini Durban. If you have been to Durban, this place gives you a vibe of Durban. What do I mean by that? The people look like the Zulu people. The language in here sounds like Isu Zulu. It's called Zulu. Zulu in South Africa. That's the language that is being spoken by the people of Durban. But listen, I, I, I just have to get someone to talk to because this is just first impression. And maybe there is a bit of truth to that. So he asked one of the local, have you ever been to South Africa? I find that it looks very similar. And the local informs Watamaya that in fact the Zulus immigrated to Zimbabwe in the 1820s. This is why many different people look like they're from Zulu culture. They have similar languages and cultures that have all intertwined in Zimbabwe. Have you ever been to Durban, brother? No, I haven't been to Durban. Have you been to South Africa? Yeah, yeah, I've been to South Africa. I've been to Gauteng province, Joburg, and the Eastern Cape. Can I ask you a question? Yes, man. It's my first time in here. And this city gives me a vibe of Durban, South Africa, or even the people of South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me give you just a brief history. So the people that are here, that came to this place, uh, known as Ndebele people, migrated from KZ. Durban? Durban. 
So in about 1820, 1821, there about, a group of 300 people left with the king called King Zilias, and they migrated to present day in the city, what we know as Wovulawa. Wow! He also goes and asks people about what they love most about in Zimbabwe. Of course, it's the lifestyle. It's definitely people saying the women are beautiful in Zimbabwe. And as he travels around Zimbabwe, he's showing us different places. And he takes us on a tour of a city called Blo Blo Oyu. Sorry, my apologies. I'm going to repronounce that. Blo Oyu. And I'm not doing it justice, and I apologize for that. But he takes us there, and he meets a content creator, a YouTuber, who shares with us how it is known as the city of kings and queens. Right now, we are in the city of Bulawayo. And I'm with my brother. <laughs> city of kings. It's called Yosama Kosi, Lama Kosi Gazi. Welcome to the city of Bulawayo, Ogo Bulawayo. Established here as a town on the 4th of November, 1894, and also as a city in 1943. Bulawayo is the center. Bulawayo is our cultural city here in Bulawayo. Yes. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bulawayo, the city of kings and queens. It's called Josama Kosi Lama Kosi Gaz. Welcome to Go Bulawayo. She also shared that it's got some of the most beautiful women in Zimbabwe. And what am I definitely agreed with that. And I was in Harare, and I'm like, you know what, I don't think Zimbabwe got the most beautiful women and stuff like that. But when I came to Bulawayo, yes, oh my goodness, yes, yes, I, I look yes. left, right, center, you still see so many beautiful women, and I'm like, I had to connect with um, Deba. Definitely. Bulawayo has the most beautiful women in no. the world. You have in the world. <laughs> <laughs> in the world, I have no idea about that, but, but I know for sure that you guys got most beautiful women in Zimbabwe. We meet another gentleman that's going to share the culture and understanding and history of Bulawa. And what I really appreciated is this is where I was educated. So this is the central point of the city of Bulawayo, the city that is the home of the former African liberation icon, Dr. Joshua Mkabo Konyongolongkomo. So right behind me here is the statue of Dr. Joshua Nkomo. And this statue represents an end of an era and the beginning of a new one. Because right here, this is where the statue of the former colonizer, Cecil John Rhodes, used to, to, to stand. And upon attainment of uh, liberation, his statue was removed and replaced very rightly by the statue the, the former liberator, Dr. Joshua Nkomo. So Dr. Joshua Nkomo formed the very first uh, liberation movement in the country, and he fought so viciously for the liberation of the local people from the yoke of colonization. And upon independence, he was um, appointed as Minister of Home Affairs and later the Vice President of the country, a position that he held until he died um, in 1999. Yes, the Zulus have been part of this country, and he shared that there's many different ethnicities and cultures all wrapped into one, and it is called the cultural hub. So many different individuals with different nationalities and ethnic backgrounds coming together to create an amazing city. As I mentioned, the city of kings and queens. Now this is from history, of course, and as we discover more as the story unfolds, we understand there's a bitter history to below which uh, apparently is the home of arts and culture in Zimbabwe. So this is the center for the Ndebele people. Although we have an influx of different cultures around the city of Bulawayo, we have almost every ethnic group that's found in Zimbabwe, right here in the city of Bulawayo. So we find a lot of uh, cultural expression, artistic expression, right here in the city of Bulawayo. It wasn't a pretty sight, definitely not. In the 1800s, when the colonizers came, the colonizers had a strategy. They were very specific on what they wanted to accomplish. They wanted to get closer, to be able to strategize, to take over Cairo. But they also knew there was minerals and ivory to be taken advantage of. Their main goal was to knock out the monarchy, to topple the monarchy. And as they started to come, the king at the time 
was nerved, of course, and burnt down the habits and fled north just to get rid of it. Of course, the locals were a little bit skeptical, and of course, they were introduced to some of the settlers. The settlers, um, the British South Africa Company, when they came in, they settled in Mashonale, the other side of the, of the, of the country, where Harare and the other towns are situated. But uh, in 1893, they decided they wanted to come over and occupy Matebeleland because it was strategic to, the, to their dream, their Cape to Cairo dream. And also there was lots of mineral wealth here and also lots of ivory. So um, a conflict was hatched by the settler government uh, to, to just uh, find a means of toppling the, the, the monarch. Mm. So a war was fought, which led to the king actually burning down his capital and heading north, actually fleeing from the, from the settlers. We met C.C. John Rhodes, who was there and was known as the nice white man. And then, of course, Leonard Jameson, who was known as the bad white man. Now, all of the settlers, all in everybody's eyes, should be as the bad white men. But Rhodes had created an illusion. He was using trickery to get into the good graces of the locals. He wanted them to see him as the peacemaker, the person that was going to broker the relationships between the black, blacks and whites. Cecil John Rhodes managed to weave uh, he, he, himself into the hearts of the locals using trickery. Um, Cecil Rhodes came and wanted to appear as the good white man uh, who was brokering peace between the black uh, locals and the bad white man. From the get-go, they had their selfish reasons for being there and they were not going to let anything get in their way or anyone. As the gentleman was sharing, as he was showing Watamaya to the different areas as they traveled, there were many different icons that stood out that enriched the story of this bitter history. He saw a tree that looked out of place. Most of the other trees were exotic and all lined up, but there was one indigenous tree that was off kilter, out of the way. And the local shared with Watamaya that this was known as the hanging tree. As far as um, the narrative of the subjugation of the native people, as well as their liberation is concerned, this tree right here is a testimony to the brutality of the settler regime upon the, the native people. If a, a, just a walk around the city of Bulawayo will show you that the rest of the trees within the city center are all exotic and they are lined up. But this one is out of line and is indigenous. And it was left like that for a purpose. Um, this tree is the famous or rather infamous hanging tree. So, um, in 1896, uh, after a, an uprising of the local people against the settler uh, leadership, those people were identified as the leaders. Those who were inciting others uh, to, to rise against the government were identified and taken to this tree for hanging. So they were hanged publicly and left like that for everyone else to see so that they would um, set an example um, which would deter any, 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 any native from uh, ever thinking of revolting against the settler government. When the locals revolted after some time, they being unhappy after many sieges and many of the locals being tormented, assaulted and murdered, there was an uprising and many fought. And there were certain groups of people that came across as the leaders. So of course the settlers took the leaders and hung them on this tree and left them there for all the others to see to discourage any more uprising or revolts from the locals. This is heartbreaking to hear, but it was unfortunately that's the history of this tree. The tree has remained there as a reminder of the tragedy and the loss of life. So there is a jail just um, close to this tree. It was known as the Bulawayo Gawol. The rest of the people would be taken there, but those leaders, the, 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 the key leaders of the uprising, would be fished out and hanged and left like that in public for everyone to, 
uh, to learn a lesson that you don't uh, revolt against uh, the, the whites. So this tree is called the false Amarola. As we go further on this tour, we hear about this beautiful benevolent place of the spirits of kings and queens. This is an area that was sacred to the locals. It was a place where they knew that the spirits of chiefs and kings and queens were there and they would go there to remember. It was a sacred place where they really kept dear to their heart. So this is the, um, the apex of the hill, the hill called Malinda Nzimu, the hill which was the resting place of the benevolent spirits of the nation. Wow. So it was a sacred area. Not anybody could just come here, let alone be buried here. But Rhodes and Jameson didn't care about all of that. They just saw this as a beautiful land, a place that was referred to as somewhere where you could see the entire world from. When Rodmeyer was there, it was a big rock with a couple of other rocks on it, but it was a very solitude area. Rhodes enjoyed this space so much and thought so highly of himself, and the locals also thought highly of him, that he convinced the locals that he should be buried there. He, despite nobody, no, not even a king or queen had actually been buried there. He felt that he deserved this. And because he had tricked all the locals to see him as the great white chief, the one that was making peace amongst the blacks and white, they agreed. But we have Cecil Rhodes' uh, remains lying here. Um, so how it happened? Um, is a, 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 a story of trickery because Cecil John Rhodes managed to weave uh, he, he, himself into the hearts of the locals using trickery. Um, Cecil Rhodes came and wanted to appear as the good white man uh, who was brokering peace between the black uh, locals and the bad white man uh, uh, in the form of uh, Leander Jemerson. Leander Star Jemerson, who was the leader of the settler government. But then Leander Star Jemerson was the leader representing Cecil Rhodes. Rhodes then continued to insist that Jemerson and other colonizers be buried there as well. This kind of goes against everything that the locals were feeling as this was a sacred location. He writes also in his will that he wants Jemerson, the same Jemerson was tormenting locals, he wants him to be buried here. So this is honored because he, it's him who is saying it. His emotions were raw. He didn't understand and he asked hard questions. Why was there a monument on this land? Why were the settlers the only one buried there? Why have they not been exhumed and allowed the locals to have this space back? And the local agreed with him that yes, this is true. But as this is protected land, this is how it stands. Wow. Um has anyone tried to assume this before? Um, yeah, they, they have been calls uh, to, to exhume. But um, so far, it, it hasn't happened because as a national monument, it's, it's also protected, protected. by the, the laws of the land. Yeah. Yes. This is the thing about history. Even though it's bitter and horrible to hear, it has to stay the way it is. We need to learn from the wrongs and move forward. Doesn't make it easy, but I can't believe that all the history I had heard had nothing like this. I never heard of the tragedy, the atrocities, and the impact the colonizers had made on the African people's lives. And it was really hard to swallow. And Watamai was so frustrated that he stomped around that area despite it being a burial. He was not happy. And he let us know that. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I hope it makes sense though. Why would a sacred place like this be for the colonizers? Okay. Because it's only, you're not even showing me that a king was buried in here. Who, see, another person is there. Who is that? Okay. So that place there, that cross, you see the cross? No, I'm not oh, you even talking the, about a cross. You There's mean, another. Okay. So this is the grave of the first prime minister. Who is also a colonizer? Who is also a colonizer? This are colonizers. 
Yes. Yeah. Sissy John Rose was the colonizer. Yeah. Jameson was also the colonizer. Yeah. So why pa would you... Charles Patrick John Coughlin is a colonizer. The, the, so there's no loka that was buried in here? No loka was buried, in, buried here. What I always find really interesting with any YouTuber is as you're always on camera, your emotions come right through and it's really not time for you to breathe. And it really made good content, in my opinion, with Watamaya because we saw how he really felt. He was hoping that the leaders of the country would hear what he said, although he called himself only a young traveler. But he brings up very good points that really, truly, this sacred land for the local people really should not be a monument for the colonizers. I'm not happy the fact that a place like this is only for colonizers. But anyway, uh, who am I? I'm just a young traveler traveling across the continent. But I just hope that the leaders of this country will see this video because for me, I don't think it makes sense. Yeah, in as much as for us to know that something like this sort happened in this country, yeah. I don't think it's right for a place like this to be a monument for colonizers. For colonizers. I mean, this history even... I'm not saying erase the history, yeah. but you could still bury them in a place where we can all go and see that, okay, this is where they were buried, but not here. Okay. I, I'm sorry, this, this is what I think, you know. As Watermar continues to show us Zimbabwe, he also expresses how in Zimbabwe, everything is going uphill and he's exhausted by taking us on all these trips. And this made me pause and think, not only is he emotionally going through a lot of turmoil as he's creating content in these different countries, as he's learning and seeing things firsthand, but also he's physically exhausted. We don't know what goes into all the planning and executing of all these videos. It's time consuming, it's exhausting, but he says he's doing it for us and I appreciate that. So thank you, Watamaya. To be honest, I'm tired of climbing. Since I came to Zimbabwe, to see anything, I need to climb. And being in Matopos, it's even worse. I've been climbing, 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 climbing. Right now, we're on our way to see the cave painting. They call it a rhino cave painting. There are people that were existing in here. I mean, the settlers of this place before anyone else, man. Yeah, so let's just keep climbing, even though it's tiring. But I'm doing this for you guys, man. Things that I do for you guys. So if you watch, you better share the video. Like the video. In a way of appreciating what we do. He took us to go and visit the Rhino Cave Painting. And this was a place where there was rock art created by the sand people. And this place was more than that. As he climbed the hill and we started to see these sand sculptures, and to go and explore the different culture behind and history behind this place. It was really interesting because the guide asked, what animals do you see in these stone sculptures? And of course, we heard camel, we heard bird, we heard lamb. And what am I said, rhino. I would have thought that too, what am I? Because that's the name of the place, the rhino paint, cave paintings. So guys, in Matropos, if we can't find live animals, we can always find animals somehow. Really? Either drawn on rocks by the sand people or naturally made on rock, just as that rock straight ahead there. When you look at that rock, what do you see? Looks like a Zimbabwean bird. Zimbabwean bird? Job? What do you think? A camel? Steve? A tortoise? A rhino. You think it's a lamb? So, so each time I come up here with people, I ask them the same question. And I've heard all these answers before except Rhino. But there was so much more to this exploration. Yes, there was the stone art, it was the cave paintings, and they, he learned about how the white rhinos, rhino, rhinos were brought to this area. So um, this particular cave uh, served a purpose uh, some time back. Uh, when um, white rhinos were sort of no longer existent within Matropos. Mm. And uh, the Zimbabwean government had an arrangement with the South African government to bring some, some, some uh, white rhinos from South Africa, from the Kruger National Park. But now they wanted to find suitable places where they can place them. And this rock, rock um, art made um, was sort of evidence that 
there used to be white rhinos here. And um, today, uh, due to that introduction of, of, of white rhinos, Hematopos is like uh, the largest number of rhinos on state land in Zimbabwe. But they created a beautiful, magnificent museum there where many na natural research is being done on vegetation, animals, archaeology, but also its beautiful galleries of different animals that have been in this land over the years, indigenous to the land, the culture, the, from the history to every day. It was amazing to see all the different animals that they had on display, including a huge elephant, the second largest in the world. The largest one is in Massachusetts, U.S. Yeah, we said it's the best museum in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. The biggest? The oh. biggest and best in terms of content, in terms of the research output, and in terms of what it showcases. This is the second largest mounted elephant in the whole world. Wadamaya was in, amazed at all the stuff that was happening. And we heard that there were still research happening here to understand the makeup of Zimbabwe, the natural preservation and what is being done from everything from vegetarian insects, reptiles, mammals, and all the natural resources. What goes on in here? So there's a lot of scientific research taking place okay. about all um, living nature and even non-living nature. So we have several departments. Uh, some are researching on mammals, some on reptiles, some on uh, fish, some on birds, uh, some on geology, mm. paleontology, and also kind of that kind of stuff. Uh, we also do have an um, archaeology department that tries to find out what happened in the past. I was inspired to hear about all this history being collected and demonstrated and exhibited for anyone to go and visit. This is a great place for us as tourists, or virtual tourists in this case, to explore Zimbabwe to see all the country has to offer. The history, although bitter, has beauty to it and all the beautiful resources and life greenery that it has in displays. And thank you, Wadamaya, for taking me on this tour. This was a really beautiful video to watch. However, it was hard to understand how I have been lied to or deceived, perhaps is a better word, with only hearing half the truth as I've been educated here in Canada. I encourage everybody to check out this video. It is eye-opening. All the videos from Zimbabwe and every country that Wadamaya travels to is, are full of beauty, history, and culture. And I love the fact that we're hearing from the locals about all of these factors. I will definitely go and educate myself from many different African resources going forward because obviously the story and history of colonization is a bitter one and something that we have to acknowledge as a white person. The wrongs that were done to so many Africans years ago impact us every day, including today. So please, let's join together to educate ourselves on the truth, not what propaganda or the North American culture has taught us. It is important. I will do my part and I hope you will do yours as well. Until next time, thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great day. Bye.